Well, we are going through the fruit of the Spirit, and each week we've had an assignment. So, how did you show goodness last week? That was a tough one. <clears throat> how did you show it? Anybody want to share? Not everybody all at once. Yes, ma'am. I went to be with a friend. I lost her husband. Mm. Yeah, I absolutely. Mean, especially when I cry as hard as she does. <laughs> Understand. Sometimes it's just about being there. <laughs> That's right. Yep, yeah, our presence. It's very good, Miss Karen. Thank you. Anybody else? How were you able to show goodness this last week? Everybody's going to be real quiet today, huh? <laughs> My dad had a procedure this week, and mm -hmm. I was just able to be there for my parents. That's good. Don't think of this as bragging. This is just following through on the assignment that you were given. It was a lot of hours sitting in the hospital. I'll bet. How is he doing? How's he doing? Um, he's improving, still a little pain, but okay. you'd say a lot of pain. Gotcha. Well, we'll keep praying for him. He has yellow urine. <laughs> Sometimes it's the little things. They found an active bleeding tumor. Okay. Keep praying. Yes, ma'am. Anybody else? Mine for this week was yesterday. There's been a guy I've been talking to. He is a retired Anglican priest. And he was in the Anglican church for 20 years. I mean, when I walked over to see him, I, I saw him when I first went into this place in the he starts speaking Latin to me. I mean, he starts going through the whole Latin mass and just laughs. And somebody else said, hey, he's speaking in tongues. I said, well, Latin and tongues, that's a little different. And uh, we were laughing. But he came over and sat with me for a while. And uh, he's done this a couple of weeks in a row now. And it's given me the chance to talk to him about some things. He was really hurt in a church that he was at. And he was there 20 years and then has been completely out of church ministry, everything, for 20 years. So he's one that's been, uh, he's very hard right now, but very uh, open to talk to me because we've built a relationship over the past few months. And so for me, it was sitting there and just letting him talk. Um, and I know that's just a little thing, but to him, it was a big thing because he was able to talk about things that he doesn't get to talk to other people about. So that was mine for this week, and I'm keeping working on him. His name's Sam. So if you think about it, pray for Sam. Um, super, super nice guy. So. I'm working on him. We'll get him eventually. <laughs> Katie, I also want to share uh -huh. that um, goodness was shown to us. Oh, yeah, that's a great way to too. Yeah. Um, we've been in two different facilities, and we pretty much felt that there was neglect, mm -hmm. and um, there was compassion there. But this week, uh, when we were at the help, um, everyone that came in just poured out compassion. Wow. Even starting with the doctor and the mm -hmm. and staff, this housekeeping guy comes in and he piles of boxes and, and he comes in several times a day and just to check and see if you have everything. And, wow. Um, these other places my dad was, he was there for a couple weeks, three or four weeks at mm -hmm. a time, and they never changed his bedding. Wow. Um, and he slept in this bed one night. The aide that came in got him up to move around, put him in a chair, change his bed, gave him <clears throat> nice nightgown for the next night, and just goodness. There's wow. this peace over you know, knowing so many things. And just looking at the That's thing. great. Anybody else have goodness shown to you? Yes, ma'am. That's exactly what I was saying before she started talking. That I didn't really feel like look for an opportunity to do goodness um, because I was angry this week. I'm not gonna lie, like I was just really angry. But God. 
watch him. He did it through my daughter and then through my sister Erica and my best friend and kid. And it was like just boom, 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 right after one, right after another. Um, <coughs> Thursday night and then, you know, Janisha first thing, Friday morning, and then my sister Erica, like around 11 o'clock. And I needed You got a pretty good daughter. I, I do. <laughs> I'm so grateful for her. Like, I thank God for her. So, goodness was shown to me. I didn't get a chance to show goodness. That's great. Goodness was definitely shown to me. And awesome. He come out of my anger state, and I appreciate that. Awesome. Yeah. Amen. Anybody else have goodness shown to you? I just want to say I really appreciate Nicole's transparency. Yeah. You know, ever since she's been part of this group, she's really just added that um, sincerity mm -hmm. and not afraid to show um, what God's doing in her life, and when even she, when she fails, and that's that's an encouragement to, to us to be real with one another. Yep. So, man, thankful for that. Amen. Anybody else? I got one, and it's probably maybe I don't know if I should even speak. I mean, because it's okay. when I was praying for you and Naomi up in this church, my heart aches with different things that's happened. And you know what he showed me? He goes, Kieran, this has got goodness to me, okay? Pastor Andy brought people into this church when the COVID was there. Why are you worried? <laughs> he said, it's going to be fine. I've got him. And so I just feel like God's talking to me. That's when, good. In my, you know, the mornings is when yep. I try to get my devotions in. But he was showing me faith. He was showing me hope if I would have the faith. Mm -hmm. and so I had to ask him to forgive me for not having more faith. You know, walk by faith, not by sight. Yep. But that was walking by sight, too, because you brought him in. Even when <laughs> COVID was down, you've got the best pastor to help you out right here in this 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 place. And I feel the Holy Spirit when we came in the last time. That's goodness when God can help you feel yeah. that. It's like, show us what to do. And he, he, I'm here. Yep, he shows <laughs> us. That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, we got exciting things happening. We're we're not officially launched or anything. We're, you know, Dave's got the paperwork in. I think this last week or week before, last week. Yep. And so we're uh, filing for all of that good stuff. And so we're not we're not pushing yet to bring anybody in. We're not really inviting people too much yet. We want to get everything settled and set and and then begin to do that. So. But we're not we're not telling people not to. No, come. no, no, not at all. No. Everybody's Just, welcome. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry. Is this are you is Faithway on YouTube? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We we'll, uh, we'll figure it out. Okay. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Good. Well, the last seven weeks we've talked about the fruit of the spirit. We've talked about that the Holy Spirit is the gift, and that He is the one who gives us these gifts. And we've talked about how Jesus uses the illustration of fruit and grapes and vines. So we're in Galatians chapter 5, and the Bible says, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. And again, that, that guide means to follow. Let the Holy Spirit, you, you be the one who follows him. He's your guide. Follow him. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting with each other. And again, to that, I say amen every week. Those two forces inside of us that fight all the time. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, these are the fruits of the flesh, 
the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousies, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, divisions, envying, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living in that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. We talked about that in the past. But, he makes the transition from the fruit of the flesh to the fruit of the spirit. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There's no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. And we talked about that last week. Since we're living by the Spirit, let us follow. That follow means to march in step with. The Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. So it begins and ends with our walk with the Lord. And again, our walk with the Lord is very important. But our, uh, and our walk with, in life is very important. The way we live our life is very important because people watch us. So even uh, the way we live is important, but who we walk with is even more important. And again, we all you know, have the idea that, well, I'm a strong person, and no matter where I am, I can, I can do it, and I'll be just fine. But we're all impacted by the people that we're connected to. And that's why we've got to be connected to the right person. And we've paralleled it with this, this teaching, this, this series with John 15 that says, Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot produce, be fruitful unless you remain in me. So our walk is connected to the Holy Spirit. And that's how we get the fruit in our lives. He says, yes, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. It's pretty easy to tell who we're connected to by the fruit that is in our life. The way I live shows. You know, the old saying that's always been said, you know, don't, you can't judge a book by its cover. I don't believe that's true. You know, I think you can judge a book by its cover and tell what's in the book by what's on the outside of the book. Just like in our lives, you can tell what's on the inside by the way we live our life. If we are connected to the vine, if we're walking with Christ, if we're filled with the Spirit, we are going to have these fruit, these markers in our life, and it's going to be very obvious that we're connected to the Lord. So, that brings us to today. Faithfulness. And that's why all the songs had to do with faithfulness today. Faithfulness is this word. It's the word pistis which is translated, amongst other things, as faith, belief, and trusted in other places in the Bible. So people who are faithful are people who are dependable. These are people that we can trust, someone who is faithful. Do you have somebody in your life that you could say, that person is faithful, that person's dependable, that person is trustworthy, and you're willing to admit who it is? That was a question. <laughs> Do you have somebody like that in your life? My wife. Your wife? I hope so. Oh, yeah. In every way. Anybody else? You got somebody like that in your life? My mom. Your mom. Definitely. Uh, my wife, too. <laughs> 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 Listen, this is not the way to earn brownie points. You know? <laughs> I would hope that we could trust our spouse, you know, our family. Do you have somebody outside of your family, though, that you can say, that's a person that I can trust? Good. You know, I meet every Thursday with a guy who's been a pastor for 40 years, and he's kind of one of my mentors. We meet Thursdays at 4.30, between 4.30 and 5.30, he's been through everything that I have been through in my entire life on steroids. Um, from church experiences to family experiences to experience with kids, everything. And for an hour, this older man who has planted churches, pastored the largest church in Kansas City for a long time, um, pours into me for an hour and asks me questions and keeps me accountable and helps me and encourages me and I feel like that's a person that I can trust they genuinely care and love and, and I think it's important for us to have people like that that are a little further down the road maybe uh, not just in, not maybe in age but maybe in experience in certain areas or someone that we can confide in someone who can gonna get who's gonna give us godly counsel 
1 Corinthians says this, Now you have every spiritual gift you need as you will eagerly wait for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be free from all blame on this day when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. God will do this for he is faithful to do what he says. He has initiated you into partnership with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. God is the ultimate example of faithfulness. How's he been faithful to you this week? How has God been faithful to you? We've talked about, you know, goodness a few minutes ago, but how's God been faithful to you this week? Anybody? I'll share mine. I had two things that I had been praying about. Um, both of them were with my job. So I pray the Lord, you know, Lord, I, I don't want to be stuck doing this specific job forever. And this week, uh, this last week, our vice president of the whole company, uh, you know, flew into town to talk to me about what the future looks like. And I thought, wow, Lord, that's, I just prayed about this. Not, not the, just a couple of weeks I had been praying about it. The Lord just was faithful to, and then they gave us a, a bonus this week. So I was like, okay, thank you, Lord. Uh, he was faithful. He was faithful to me. Anybody else, the Lord was faithful to you this week? Yes, ma'am. Um, a new position at work. That's awesome. That's awesome. Anybody else? Something God was faithful to you with this week? Okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot there. <laughs> Here's one way we may not think of, of God's faithfulness to us. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says, If you think you're standing strong, be careful not to fall. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience, and God is faithful. How's God faithful? He'll not allow the temptations to be more than you can stand. When you're tempted, he will show you a way out so you can endure. He's faithful to not allow my temptations to be more than I can handle. He's faithful to show me a way out of the temptation so I don't have to sin. You know, honestly, we could probably spend all day talking about how faithful God has been to us through our lives or different ways God has been faithful to us. But, but what about us? Are we marked by faithfulness? Because the fruit of the Spirit is obviously something that God has, and he is good, and he is faithful. But what about us? Are we marked by that? 1 Corinthians 4.2 says, Now a person who's put in charge is a manager. That word manager means a steward. In the old King James is the way it's translated there. Some other translations call it an overseer. But a manager must be faithful. The old King James says it's a uh, um, now my mind just went absolutely blank. I have it memorized there. It's required of stewards that a man be bound, found faithful. So as, as a steward, as a manager, as an overseer, this is what's what all of us are. We're managers, overseers, stewards of everything because everything belongs to God, even us, even I, my own body, everything we have. And we're simply managers or overseers of his property, and we're to be faithful with it. And being faithful is a mark of maturity in the life of a Christian. Then if that's true, if being faithful is the mark of a maturity, then refusing to accept responsibility, the opposite of that, would be a mark of immaturity. So when I refuse to take responsibility for my own actions, that's a mark of immaturity. But if I remain faithful, that's a mark of maturity. Our kids are great examples of this, aren't they? Not just mine, but your kids too. Mine are perfect examples because they have uh, a mother who is imperfect. Um, oh. <laughs> 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 oh. <laughs> I knew she was distracted. I could slip that one in. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, but because we're sinners, we're, we're fallen. But before we get too hard on kids, it goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Remember when God called out Adam? And what did he say? It was the woman's fault. And he goes to Eve, it was the serpent's fault. I, I mean, we're all good at that. It's not my fault. We don't like to accept responsibility or take responsibility for when we are wrong. 
when we sin, we like to blame other people or our circumstances. But in God's kingdom, when we're faithful and we take responsibility of small things, we're given more. God's given all of us responsibilities. And when we disobey or we don't take responsibility, we're unfaithful. And that spiritual immaturity, it's a lack of a connection to the vine. So what does that look like for us today? Well, we're going to look at another passage, kind of a longer passage, in Matthew 25. And this is a parable that I want us to look at. So, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted. That word entrusted has to do with stewardship. So he's entrusting them. These are his stewards. He entrusted them his money uh, while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last. Dividing it in proportion to their abilities, and he left on his trip. Who determined their abilities? Who determined which one got what? Did they or did the master? The master did. Okay, very good. He's the one who determined who got what. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. The servant with two bags of silver went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account how they had used his money. It's his. The servant whom he had trusted five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, I, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I earned two more. The master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I'll give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you are a harsh man. Harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid. I would lose your money. So I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money at the bank? At least that I've gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with 10 bags of silver to those who use well, those who are faithful, with what they're given, even more will be given, and they who have an abundance. Uh, but from those who do nothing, that's the unfaithful, even what they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into outer darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's, there's four big lessons in that parable that we can learn. I'm going to just gonna tell you what they are, and then we'll go through one at a time on the screen. But the first, this is what it is. God gives everybody different gifts. More responsibility is good. People who are lazy with God's talents are punished. And only people, or, and only people who invest get a return. That's what we're going to talk about today in being faithful. So the first one, God gives everybody different gifts. Here in the story, we have five, two, one. One got five, one got two, one got one. And some people have multiple talents. If we're going to apply this to us today, it's not just, well, you get this talent, you get that talent. God gives multiple. It's a gift to mix that we are given. So, you know, I, I kind of, I like and don't like those spiritual gift tests because it tries to pigeonhole you into one thing when we're, we're given a mix of things. But here we've got multiple talents given and they're capable of multiple responsibilities and the, the master decided who was capable of what. And God is the one who decides if I'm capable of what and what you're capable of and gives us these talents, these gifts, talents, and abilities uh, as he sees fit. Now, the only th thing the master was concerned with was how each one managed what was given to him. He wasn't concerned with who had five, two, and one. He was concerned with what they did with what they were given. We're the ones who get concerned with what we got and the amounts of what we get. I mean, some of us wish we could sing better or wish we were better at speaking or wish we were better at this or 
I wish I was more organized, or wish I could do this, that, the other. I wish I could teach. I wish I could work with kids. I wish I could whatever it is. But we're the ones who get concerned with that. God's simply concerned with how we use what he gave us. Because all of us have been given gifts. God doesn't compare our gifts. We're the ones who get stuck in the comparison trap. God just wants us to be faithful with what he's given us. We don't have the same talents, abilities, or gifts as others, but we do have the same ability to be faithful with what we have. And that's what we're supposed to be, faithful. Here's a second one. More responsibility is good. The master was full of praise, Matthew 25. These verses aren't up there. I just put the main things. I'll read these to you. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I'll give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The master said, well done, to the next one. My good and faithful servant, you have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I'll give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. He says it to the one who had five and doubled it, the one who had two and doubled it. He said the exact same thing to both of them, although one came back with ten and one came back with four. The amount was not the concern. It was that they were faithful with what they were given. So the two servants who had invested their talents got more responsibilities. More was given to them. But all the responsibilities were taken away from the one who did nothing with his talent. And in God's kingdom, responsibility is given to those who can handle it. God gives us things that he knows we can handle. I, I was reading a book, Max Licato. You guys know who Max Licato is? So I was reading Max Licato this week. Here's a, I'm going to look this up and read it. In his book, When God Whispers Your Name, Max Licato tells the story of a man named John Eglin who had never preached a sermon in his life. I thought this was amazing. It wasn't that he didn't want to. He just never needed to. But then one morning he did. The snow was left. The snow left his town of Colchester, England, buried white. When he awoke on January Sunday in 1850, he thought of staying home. Who would go to church in such weather? But he reconsidered. He was, after all, a deacon. And if the deacons didn't go, who would? So he put on his boots, his hat, his coat, and walked six miles to his Methodist church. He, was the, he wasn't the only member who considered staying at home. In fact, uh, he was one of the few who came. Only 13 people showed up. 12 members and one visitor. Even the minister was snowed in. Someone suggested that they go home and Eglin uh, would hear none of that. They'd come this far, they would have a service. Besides, they had a visitor, a 13-year-old boy. But who would preach? Eglin was the only deacon. It fell to him, and so he did. His sermon lasted only three minutes. <laughs> That's my kind of church, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> It drifted and wondered and made no point <laughs> in an effort to make several. But at the end, an uncharacteristic courage settled upon the man. He lifted his eyes and looked straight at the boy and challenged, Young man, look to Jesus. Look, look, look. Did the challenge make a difference? Let the boy, now a man, answer. Here's what the boy said. I did look. And then there was a cloud on my head lifted. A darkness rolled away. And that moment I saw the sun. What was the boy's name? Charles Haddon Spurgeon, England's prince of preachers. Some people do not want more responsibility. In fact, they look forward to getting rid of it. But in God's kingdom, however, we are always asked to put forth 100% effort to use the gifts God has given us. Can you imagine if that deacon had not been faithful, what would happen? The world would be very different without Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers. Three, people who are lazy with God's talents are punished. Back in our Matthew 25, it says, Then he ordered, Take the money from the servant and give it to the one with ten bags of silver. That's verse 28, verse 30 says, Now throw this useless servant into outer darkness, where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This guy buried his talent. 
And he really forgot about it and went on about his life, just like everything was normal. And what did the master call him? Wicked and lazy. You know, there's one type of person in all the Bible that God never uses to do anything great for him. Do you know what type of person that is? A lazy person. God doesn't use lazy people. That's what this servant was. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be lazy for the Lord. I want to use what he's given to me. Last one and we're done. Only people who invest get a return. Verse 29 in Matthew 25 where we started says, To those who use well what they're given, even more will be given, and they that have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what they have will be taken away. I mean, farmers know this, or if you have a garden, you know this, or if you've ever planted flowers, you know this. You plant your seed, and you have some faith, you water it, and you take care of it, and it's going to hopefully grow. Unless it's at my house, and it will die. <laughs> no questions. <laughs> We're not good with, with plants. But if you don't plant, all you're going to have is weeds in your field. You use it, or you lose it. And there's a parallel in God's kingdom. When we use the talent God's given us, when we care for it, when we work at it, we're going to get better at it, and he's going to give us more. And that will never be taken from us. People who practice and use what God has given them get better at it. You can get better at all the things God gives you, all the talents that God gives you. But if we decide not to be faithful with our God-given talents, they'll be taken from us. I read this week. I thought this was really cool. In 1972, NASA launched an exploratory space probe called Pioneer 10. You remember that? 1972, so you were in your 20s, Tim? Yeah. So you probably remember that pretty well. <laughs> we express goodness to you. <laughs> <laughs> So Pioneer 10, the probe was designed to reach Jupiter, take pictures, and transmit the information back to Earth. Time Magazine reporter Leif Jarif explained that this bold event required that the probe not only travel the distance, no probe had ever gone past Mars, but that it would also need to pass through Jupiter's magnetic field, radiation belts, and atmosphere. One major concern was that the Pioneer 10 would be destroyed going through the asteroid belt before it could reach its destination. As we know, Pioneer 10 fulfilled its assignment. In fact, when it flew by Jupiter in November of 1973, the planet's tremendous gravity pitched the probe with greater speed into the solar system. At one billion miles from the sun, the tiny probe passed Saturn, then flew past Uranus at some two billion miles, Neptune by nearly three billion miles, and Pluto at almost four billion miles. So it launched in 1972. By 1997, 25 years after NASA had said goodbye to Pioneer 10, it was more than 6 billion miles from the sun. This probe that was designed to be useful for, for approximately three years continued to signal back to Earth from incredible distances far beyond its original assignment. Jeriff wrote, perhaps most remarkable, the, those signals emanate from an 8-watt transmitter which radiates about as much power as a bedroom nightlight and takes more than nine hours to reach earth similar to pioneer 10 you have a tremendous potential to be more than you may think is possible as you remain faithful to what god has given you and continually strive to be obedient to his will he will stretch you and develop you in many ways man that's an amazing story and that's what God wants to do with us. He wants to use us beyond what we think we are able to do to what he knows we are able to do. So what has God blessed us with? How are we, how are we investing it for God's glory? I don't want to waste what God's given to me, and I know you don't want to waste what God's given to you. I want to close with another story I read this week. Um, this one was... Yeah, you'll, you'll understand. This one hit me hard. Ray Steadman relates an incident in his book, Talking to My Father, that's the name of the book there, that shows the eternal results of faithfulness. Here's what he wrote. An old missionary couple had been working in Africa for years. 
They were returning to New York City to retire. They had no pension. Their health was broken. They were booked on the same ship as President Teddy Roosevelt, who was returning from a big game hunting expedition. No one paid them any attention. They watched the fanfare that accompanied the president's entourage with passengers trying to catch a glimpse of the great man. As the ship moved across the, street, the sea, the old missionary said to his wife, something is wrong. Why should we have given our lives and faithful service to God in Africa all these years and have no one care a thing about us? Here's a man coming back from a hunting trip and everybody makes a big deal over him, but nobody gives two hoots about us. His wife says this, dear, you shouldn't feel that way. He said, I can't help it. It doesn't seem right. When the ship docked in New York, a band was waiting to greet the president. The mayor and other dignitaries were there. The papers were full of the president's arrival, but no one noticed the missionary couple. They slipped off the ship, found a cheap flat on the east side, hoping the next day that they could find something to make a living in the city. And that night, the man's spirit broke. He said to his wife, I can't take this. God's not treating us fairly. His wife replied, why don't you go in the bedroom and tell that to the Lord? <laughs> don't you just love a wife who puts you in your place? Man. A short time later, he came out of the bedroom, but now his face was completely different. His wife asked, dear, what happened? The Lord settled it with me, he said. I told him how bitter I was that the president should receive this tremendous homecoming well, no one met us as we returned home. And when I finished, it seemed as though the Lord put his hand on my shoulder and simply said, but you're not home yet. The reward for faithfulness is knowing that you have been obedient and understanding that one day, one day, God will say, welcome home, my faithful servant. That one hit me hard. One day because we're not home yet. How can we show faithfulness this week? Our project. That was a question too. <laughs> Just kidding. No, you're fine. I always ask God to help me see every person through his eyes. Because there are people that are really hard to deal with. You know what I mean? You try to understand them and you love them. You try to love them. But God, it would be, helps my heart, I guess, off of my heart, and see them through his eyes. You always see some good there. Mm -hmm. And that's what Jesus came on this earth, was to help us love one another. Yep. And we don't have enough love in this world today. Compassion is gone. People don't help you if you're in trouble. They take pictures of you get snot beat out of you. You know, they won't come over. The men don't do like they used to do. You don't touch that woman with her baby unless you can deal with me. That doesn't happen anymore. They pick their phones up. <laughs> but yeah. my, my project is that God will never let me be hard, that I will always see people through his eyes so I can see That's the good. Them. That's good. Anybody else? How can we be faithful? How can we use the talents that God has given us this week? I think it would be good for us just to think about it. So that's your project for this week. We've had a project the last few weeks. That's our project for this week. How can I be faithful? How can I uh, use the gifts, the talents, and abilities that God's given me? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for giving us gifts. Thank you for giving us talents and abilities to use for you. Help us not to be selfish and to use them just for ourselves or for our own gain, but to know that you're the one who gave them to us, and you gave them to us for a reason, and that's to use them for you to forward and to advance your kingdom. So help us to see them for what they are, not to get discouraged by all the things that are going on around us, but to see that Yes, this is a dark time in history, and there's a lot of bad happening. And we can look at it that way. Or we can look at it as what a great opportunity we have to make a difference for you. So help us to see it that way and to use the gifts, talents, and abilities you've given us to make a real difference for you in the world. Help us to be faithful. 
We ask it in your name. Amen. I think, Bill, you're up this week. Well, I get to close this out. So, appreciate Andy the message on faithfulness. And uh, I was thinking, too, about how can I be faithful this week, too. And uh, like before, I've told you guys, sometimes I listen to other preachers, you know, sometimes. And uh, listening to a guy this morning, and he was talking about uh, singing songs and praising the Lord. I think it's Ephesians 5.19. Uh, singing songs and making melody and so on and so forth. I can't quote it. Qu can't quote it. But uh, anyway, you know, God wants us to do that. And uh, he wants us to be faithful to him. And uh, he's given us all kinds of different gifts, hasn't he? And he wants us to use those gifts for him. Uh, one of my gifts, I was thinking, and this is silly, but... Uh, you know, God's given me a sense of humor, and I appreciate that. And uh, sometimes it's silly humor, but uh, and even sometimes, you know, I've got to be known for, oh, that's a bill joke. <laughs> you know, but you know, <laughs> God, God, He can use that any way He wants to. And I was thinking about the songs, you know, that, uh, you know, I don't have one of them great voices, but I was thinking about. The songs that Andy played this morning, you know, Great Is Your Faithfulness, the two different versions of them, you know, uh, and the, the old hymn, Great Is Your Faithfulness. I remember when I was in junior high and we'd sing that song, and man, I just enjoyed singing that with the, with the uh, group at church, you know, and praising the Lord and singing that song. And uh, nowadays, I, I sing to my wife sometimes get up in the morning and uh, I'll say uh, oh Lord it's hard to be humble perfect in every way <laughs> she hears that sometimes <laughs> I'm just joking she has a sense of humor <laughs> yeah. and then another one I'll sing to her I'll just get up and I'll feel good you know I'm not really a morning person all the time but I'll, I'll just uh, think uh, good morning America how are you don't you know me I'm your native son you know but God, he wants us to sing to him, you know, praises every day. And that verse in Ephesians 5, 19, it's not just a, a verse that we take for granted. It's kind of like a command that God gives us to, to sing to him and to praise him and to bring him glory every day through everything we do. And I don't know about you, but sometimes those songs, they just pop in, up and through my head of a day, you know, just uh, from the Christian radio or for, for hymns. I'll, I'll be singing that this this week probably. Sometimes, you know, even when we get into those areas of temptation, the Holy Spirit, he puts that song in our heart, uh, you know, that, and we hear those words. Sometimes we don't listen to them, but we know it's the Holy Spirit using that. So faithfulness. Sing to the Lord this week. Praise him. Give him glory. That's what he wants us to do. Should I pray? Go for it. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We don't deserve it, Lord. Someday before I, st I stand before your throne, I want you to say of me like you did of your servant David, well done, thou good and faithful servant, Lord. Those are the words that all of us want to hear someday. Just help us, Lord, to live this life faithful to you. We don't have much time, Lord. Who knows how long we've got. Some of us less than others. We pray that you'll come back soon, even today, Lord. Take us home. Wouldn't it be great if we were the generation that enjoyed the rapture? How glorious would that be? Thank you. Help us be faithful this week. Help us come back with stories how that we were faithful to you. Bless our church, Lord. We don't know where you're taking us on this journey, but you are taking us there. Help us to be faithful and follow you, Lord. Ask these things, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thanks, Andy.